Hey guys, it's Daniel. Welcome back. The following is my full interview with The Strokes producer Gordon Raphael, who produced some of the band's most iconic songs, including Reptilia, Last Night, Someday, Hard to Explain, and much more. Gordon Raphael produced the band's first two studio records, Is This It and Room on Fire, which are often considered the band's best two albums. He also produced the band's debut EP, The Modern Age, and had begun work on what would become the band's third album, First Impressions of Earth. In this interview with me, he talks about all of those experiences and much more, including what it was like working with the band when they were an unknown band compared to when they became famous, how Julian Casablancas recorded vocals with him, some of the behind-the-scenes history about Reptilia and their other famous songs, and many other stories. All the interviews on this channel, including this one with Gordon Raphael, are self-produced and self-financed. If you guys want to support and help me make more videos, the best way is to subscribe here to my channel. Thanks for watching. When Julian was recording his vocals, was there anything unique that he would do that was different than other vocalists you've worked with? I will say that one of the highlights of Room on Fire was that Julian sat next to me in the studio in the control room. He didn't stand in the live room. He sat next to me in a chair. So I was just like shoulder to shoulder with this guy while he was singing every word on that album. That was incredible, just incredible. And then I write about this at length in my book, just the amount of tone that that guy can make with his singing instrument, the sounds that come out of him. You know, that's why everybody loves his, him as a singer. It's just such a powerful voice and his rhythm is so uncanny. He is so in control of his rhythm that he can push, 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 go like rushing ahead of the rhythm and then end up perfectly on the rhythm. And you don't know why it's, it gives you this excitement, but he knows how to do these micro subtleties with rhythm and tone that make him a jaw dropping singer, really just a one of a kind. So cool. And generally, like how many takes would he do to get something down? Was he a one or two take kind of guy or did you do a lot of takes with him? I think for the most part of what we ever worked on, he would sing a song and you do it perfectly. And I go, wow, Julian, <laughs> unbelievable. You know, we already had the sound of the mic before he did it. You know, we did a sound just so the sound of the mic was perfect. He would just kill it. And I go, you know, as far as I'm concerned, we could print that. That There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. He goes, yeah, I got 10 other ways I was thinking of trying this. <laughs> 10 other ways. What do you mean 10 other ways? Okay, give me another track. And he'd do it again. Perfect, but different than the first time. And he did that 10 times. And then he would want to know which of those takes, which of those moments fit each phrase perfectly. So I would say he would do 10 takes. And not because it took him 10 tries to get the song right, but he had 10 different ways that he could approach every song and he wanted to try them all so he knew which was the best way to do it. Did he ever have any sort of expectation as to which of these ways would be the best? Or was it always kind of, let's just try this out and see what works? Not only did he not know which would be the best, but I'm sure knowing him, the, the bit I know him from working with him, I'm sure he thought there were three other ways he could also do it that he kind of wished he would have tried. He just, and it bugs him to probably to this day that he didn't try it. One other way I was going to do that phrase on that song. I'm sure he's that kind of guy. That is really cool. I mean, were there any particular types of mics that he would like to use or whatever you provided him, would he just do with whatever you, you gave him? I got one funny story. The microphone I had at my studio, we weren't a rich, we, we weren't rich when we built my first studio. We had I think a $10,000 music instrument budget. We needed to get the computer sorted and the recording software sorted. And people gave us some stuff and we bought the rest. And I had this like $400 condenser microphone from Audio Technica. And that was the microphone that he did the EP on. And he did the parts of the album on it. And I borrowed a $3,000 Neumann microphone from my neighbor at the studio across the way. And I set it up. Julian came to do his vocal session that day. And he looked and he goes, what's that? I said, Julian, that is a Neumann microphone, man. That is a really good microphone. He says, I don't like the look of it. I don't, I get a bad feeling about that. And I said, no, man, trust me. This microphone is so awesome. You're going to love it. And he looked at me very doubtfully and a little bit angry. I said, just try it. He sang like three notes. 
And he said, stop. I stopped Fuck this. I knew I hated this microphone. Get that thing out of here and get me my mic back. So wow. <laughs> that's my that's my vocal microphone story. What is Julian like as a person just to hang out with? It's very fun. Like he's extremely uh, focused. If you talk with him, he really listens to you and he's very warm. I'm of a different generation than him. And he also grew up in New York City like really in the thick of things, in the middle of things. So he was exposed to a lot of ideas very quickly, mm. very big ideas. And when you meet a real New Yorker who grew up in New York and kind of worked their way through that system, they're always kind of impressive. They're like, wow. The creative relationship between the band members, is he the one directing everything or is there like an equal split with the creativity from your viewpoint? Uh, I don't know what's happening now. You know, they've been through many different evolutions. I think right now it's a very much of a cooperative where everybody's really, really just working on the same kind of level in putting ideas. I have reason to believe that when I worked with them in the first couple of records, that Julian was the composer of the band and everybody brought their own ideas to his compositions. And they all, all they loved his song so much that they were willing to like sweat until it was perfect. So there was a great camaraderie of working together with a singular vision. Hmm. But as the main composer, you know, Julian would often be the one that says, these are the chords of this song. And here's the counter melody I hear. And I have a great bass line for it. That's interesting. So, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier about how upfront Julian was with you about the microphones. That was very early on in your relationship. So were you surprised at all that that early on he would be that upfront with you? After the EP, I wasn't surprised at anything. <laughs> the, EP, the EP already showed me everything I could expect for the whole time I ever worked with those guys, which was that everybody was going to want me to do things at the same time, and they were all going to be vocal about it. You know, Fab was going to tell me things about Julian's vocal Julian was going to tell me things about Fab's hi-hat. Nick and, and Albert were going to want things brighter, notes quieter. You know, there was going to be a lot of onslaught of requests. And I had to really work hard to make sure that they each got a chance to hear those requests. So once I got into that, that's what everything was like all the time. So, I mean, I, I guess because some people would have probably been put off by like how upfront they were. Did that upfrontness actually make you closer with them that you were able to handle it? It did good things for both of us. When they realized that they could tell me things and I looked like I didn't really think that was a good idea, but I did it and then it sounded better and like, and then I stopped questioning them as much. I think they really loved me for that, that I would actually do the things that they wanted rather than, you know, be a boss, be like the big man who knew everything. I would actually give them a chance to try their ideas. I think that worked really well. And I learned a thing or two because there were definitely ideas I thought were just, why would you do that? And then when I heard it, I go, yeah, that's cool. Hmm. That's awesome, man. So I wanted to ask you about Reptilia. When you were recording that track, did it strike you as though it was going to be a big song? Or did you think it was just another good song from the band? I thought it was one of the most interesting and one of the most powerful there was a lot of really incredible stuff on that album, I thought. Hmm. With Reptilia in particular, I love the guitar sound on that track. How did you get the yeah. guitar sound on that track? I think that was just, I mean, there's no tricks. The only the only trick guitar track I know of is on 1251. Hmm. And I think on Reptilia, it's just a guitar, a fuzz box, an amp. And I think I might be using two mics by then, a hmm. uh, 421 Heiser and an SM57. Could be just the 421. I'll have to look at my pictures. But imagine it's just a preamp, a mic, an amplifier, a fuzz box, and those guys knowing how to get tones out of their guitar. There was no technical tricks, no effects, no reverb added other than what might have been on the amp or not. So it's a real testament to just getting the tone and capturing it. Did you get any sort of demo before working on it? Or was that another one of the tracks where you just kind of did it? They played it for me one time and then we started recording them. I didn't have any reference or any demos or anything to listen to. It's just the way we always did everything is each sound had to be kind of perfect before we started recording. Hmm. So what's the snare sound like this? Is it this? 
no, it's not right. We need a different snare drum. You need to tune it differently. You need a different microphone. You need to put it in a different place. You need a different EQ. Like everything was set before we recorded the song. Mm. It wasn't like they recorded the same way. And then later we made new songs out of it. It was like everything had to be done. Luckily, it's two guitars, bass and drums. So we're talking about 14 microphones or something like that. That Each one had to be set perfectly before they would even start tracking the song. Did anybody yeah. in the band expect that song to be big? Because it is their biggest track. So I'm just curious if anybody had any thoughts it was going to be like the biggest one. I don't I don't remember ever hearing a discussion from anybody. I was never part of those kind of discussions. Hmm. I think I remember them debating which should be the first single. I remember being privy to them talking in the same room as me and chatting among themselves about what they thought the first single should be. Hmm. But I never heard anyone say, this is our big song. This is our best song. There was never any talk like that on any song they ever recorded with me around Hmm. that one song was better than another or that this is the one that's going to blow people's minds. I remember just liking it and liking the guitar parts. And like when I watched that video, I think that's one of the coolest music videos I know of Hmm. and one of the coolest strokes videos because you can see each person doing their job like, this is what the bass is doing. You can see the fingers and all four at once. And the singer, like it's so microscopic examination of how they made that song. You can just see there's like nothing left to the imagination. It's not a technical trick. It's just look what they're doing. Can you believe what they're And then Julian's just ferocious on that video. Everything about his singing is kind of represented, at least at that time, in the way he delivers that vocal so I remember that my personal first exposure to the band that I remember of was Rock Band. Do you remember that game, Rock Band? It was like yeah. it was like Guitar Hero. Were you or the band aware that they put Reptilia on that, like on the original release for Rock Band? I certainly wasn't. I didn't. Know, I knew it existed, Rock Band, but I didn't know what it was. Um, I've never played a video game in my life. So. Really. I mean, I played Pong when it first came out. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> That's cool. That was like an arcade game that was with a computer with a dot that went yeah, back yeah, and forth. Yeah. Boop, boop. I thought that was really cool. <laughs> so do you remember recording last night? I remember recording. I, re- I can f- kind of feel like I was there recording it on the EP and on the album. It was the same as recording almost all the other songs on the album except for three, which was guitar two guitars bass and drums playing together and when that is finally done correctly later adding the vocal and working on the vocal like maybe 10 different takes of the vocal and then working with julian to find out the best phrases from each 10 takes like olympic games qualification listen to that listen, listen to all 10 of the first few lines get rid of one now you got nine Get rid of one. Now you got eight. So it was like, that was the process. Yeah. That's so cool. So how would you compare the process for recording last night on the EP to last night on the LP? What was similar? What was different? Uh, The thing that was similar was that uh, all the techniques we used were similar. The thing that was different was instead of taking like one day in total, like if we did three songs in three days, I would average, we did one song a day spread out over the weekend Maybe we took four days to do it uh, on the on the album. Hmm, very cool. And what did you? What was your initial impression of the song when you first heard it in the EP form? Did you like the song? Um, it wasn't my favorite song. Hmm. To me, it's like I thought. Okay, yeah, this is catchy. This is catchy, and it's kind of like this is the most understand. It's certainly more kind of relatable and kind of a more expectable in some ways than say the modern age or barely legal. Okay. So when that song came out, I go, okay, yeah, that beat, you know, that that's like a comfortable, familiar and lots of fun beat, but it's, that's not the kind of music I personally dig more than like the modern age is really out there, mm. you know, up on a hill or whatever. And that dark mood and that crazy crooning on that, you know, that was more like instantly. Wow. That is something else. And last night was okay. I, yeah, that's really strong, but it's not my favorite. Mm-hmm. Now there were some awesome lyrics. I mean, when he's talking about spaceships, they want to understand, and you know, grandsons, your girlfriend ain't ever gonna, and all that stuff. The lyrics I thought were 
absolutely incredible. I liked all his lyrics on everything. And that song has great examples of like, where's that coming from? Who mm. writes lyrics like spaceships they won't understand? So what did you think of the music video in particular, if I may ask? The, oh, that was an interesting, that was super interesting. Glad you brought that up because okay. that's not the album version of the music, right? Really? Yeah. They're going like, oh, well, we're signed on a major label now, but guess what, major label? We don't lip sync. We don't believe in it. And you can see the executive's face going, what? Uh, we got we to gotta make an MTV video. You know, we're, we're banking on getting our money back by putting you guys on MTV. What do you mean you won't lip sync? Come on. You got to put the hit on. The first single, you got to put it on. You got to lip sync. What do you mean you're not going to? No, fuck no. If you want us to go on MTV, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to play the song and you can film it. And that's going to be what we're going to do. So they're like, oh no, you know, we spent all this money in the studio. Now the band wants to do the song again. So God bless the Strokes for having the audacity to like, I don't want to lip sync. I'm not a cheesy kind of guy. I want to play my song and then the, you can you can film it. And I actually did, I think I, I did, I don't think, I don't think I even mixed it. I'm not sure if I mixed that song, but what I did do is they gave it to me uh, because there was a swear word in it. Hmm. And I had to, Gordon, what are we going to do? There's a swear word in our song. And this is what the management said. Like, there's a swear word and they won't play it on MTV with a swear word. I said, oh, give it to me. And I took the <laughs> word, I took the word shit and I cut it and I reversed it. So it's like, Tish! Yeah, and that's funny. <laughs> that's what's on the video. <laughs> that's so cool. So I'm curious, are you familiar with the Sum 41 Still Waiting video? I am not. So basically, Sum 41 parodied that video, that exact video. And uh, I actually, I spoke to one of their band members, Cone, the bass player, and he said, yeah, they actually ran the idea by Julian in a hotel room once saying, we're going to parody you guys. And he was like, oh, yeah, that's cool. Go ahead and do it. You should check it out. It's very right funny. It's basically that same video. They just kind of... They became the sums for that video. And the whole joke was at the beginning, there was a record executive saying, the number bands are out. It's not about Sum 41, Blink-182. It's about the strokes and stuff. You got to become like that. Anyways, that sounds cool. I want to see it. Yeah, I'll email it to you afterwards. Do you remember working on Someday? I really like that one. Like that one and Trying Your Luck are kind of in some ways similar. It's not like normal rock and roll. It's more. It's much more fun. It's so, both of those songs are so uplifting and just so unusually cool in their own way. They don't really sound like other bands. This is a very unique kind of style. I remember the rhythms of both of those songs just being so, wow, that is so cool. It's not really heavy. It's really moving and it's still rock and roll. I think other than just the mood of it and the way that the rhythms are, um, I, I think that's what I really noticed about that song while we were making it. And when you were, when you were recording it, did anything happen differently than any other songs or was it just kind of the same deal i can't remember because there were like two types of songs there were two songs that went down rather easily and quickly like new york city cops and there were songs that sometimes they'd spend all day tracking hmm. and come back the next day and say actually we want to do it in a different tempo there were some songs that really took a long time to capture and some songs that were just like, whoa, we played it two times and we kind of have it now. That's cool. So, and I don't, I don't remember for the life of me, uh, which, which one someday was. No worries, man. So when you, when you were first recording that song, or I guess in general, the songs, did they, did they give you demos or did you guys kind of just work it out in the studio? I did not have demos. Um, I think the only demo I heard is when Julian took me to his house to play me hard to explain the demo so that I could under see what what brand of drum machine he was using and mm. hear what a song with gu guitars and drum machines sounded like in his view. Cool. So that was the only time I heard a demo and the rest of it was like, what are we doing today, guys? Uh, we got this song called, is this it? Uh, it's a new one. We're going to have to work on it a little bit while we go along. Okay. That's cool. Anything special for the mics? Yeah. This one we wanted to do a brighter guitar sound. Okay, let's go. So it, it was a lot of that. When it first got together, we were doing one microphone on each instrument, except for the drums. I used three microphones for the whole drum kit. So mic on the guitar, mic on the guitar, mic on the bass. Three mics on the drums and a mic in the room. That's the sound that they liked, and that's the sound that got them kind of noticed. So on the album, I think I added one more, one more mic on the drums, and that's about it. I went from something like nine channels on the final product to 11 
on the final product because I borrowed an extra converter, for the one more channel. <laughs> so do you remember producing Hard to Explain? Very well, very, very. That one, that one is very easy to remember because it was recorded. It is one of three songs on the album that was recorded very differently okay. to the other ones. In which way? Well, you know, I have a book coming out. Yes. Have, Tell me whatever I, you I can. Book. Tell me whatever you can. Yeah. I will say that Julian asked me, how in the world can we make, how in, I want to use a drum machine for these songs. You know, I wrote them on a drum machine and I love the drum machine, but what the hell can I do? Because I don't want Fab to feel bad having to sit out. Hmm. And because I was listening to industrial music all through the 90s and even in the early 2000s, I said, dude, turning a drum into a drum machine is like a piece of cake. Man. I, I'm a synthesizer player. I can make sound, any sound, do anything. Just play the drums. I'll show you what. So I knew that for drum to sound like drum machine, I couldn't have guitar bleed. I couldn't have the normal live sound that I had on the rest of the album. I had the drums play by themselves so that I could really destroy them and build them up as me as a machine with nothing but like drum machine sounds. That's cool. And so that was the main reason that three songs on the album have a different texture is because we use this technique. And I remember immediately coming up with an idea of how to do it and then sh working on the idea with the guys listening and then seeing their faces when they actually, dude, that's Fab playing the drums. That's the real drums, but it sounds like Julian's drum machine. Like that was, I loved watching their faces and they, everybody loved that moment. So, I mean, what, what about you in particular? Was that the first time you did something like that with a band or were you seasoned in that area? Most of the stuff I've been working on in my own music was like, drum machines of every 909 drum machines 808 dmx like all those th and even the uh, cr78 like huh. all those roland and oberheim drum machines i've been using since the 80s you know really really just all the time and then in the 90s when i wanted to do industrial music i layered on real drummers playing against those drum beats so you would have the drum machine kick with the real kick and it was very hard to do like even good drummers, it's very hard for them to play exactly like a drum machine and make sure each beat was there. So from doing that a lot, it wasn't far stretched to, well, now try to make the drums sound like the drum machine. It's just a matter of, uh, there's a couple tools I need. I need a overdrive into the preamp. I need lots of EQ. I need compression. I need gates. And that's how I did it. So what were the other two songs that you did the same technique for on that record? Well, should I say it or should I let people do their own hunting? I'll give one of them. Okay. And other people, Soma. Soma. Okay. And I guess people will have yeah. to look up the other one. Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah. Just see if they can use their ears because it's quite obvious. That's cool. So what was it like working on 1251? That part of Nick's doing the lead guitar melody all the way through, that was like, that struck me right away. You know, it's so accurate. It's so melodic. It's so adventurous, you know, and to be able to sing a melody on top of a melody like that, two strong melodies at the same time, that's a bit of genius, I think. That's cool. So when you were recording and producing it, because that's a little bit different than normal, was it challenging for you to get that done properly? No, but that was one song where I actually had an idea of a production trick on the guitar. Hmm. Uh, because as I said earlier, I'm a synthesizer player, so I'm using oscillators and multiple oscillators all the time to get tones. And when I heard that melody, it reminded me of something that sounded, because he rolled all the high frequencies off and just used a lot of really middle sounds on that. Mm -hmm. I thought that sounds like one of my synthesizers, but only one of the oscillators and my synthesizer has another oscillator. And why don't I try to make that guitar sound like my synth? So okay. I had a little suggestion for him to kind of uh, imitate the second oscillator. And I always detune the oscillators to give a fat song that sound okay if you tune, tune it perfectly together it's a bit thin it's not, it's two oscillators it's not much fatter but if you detune one of the oscillators it just starts really vibrating That's so cool. i used a little of that uh philosophy on the guitar on that song was that the first time you tried that technique out it's the only time i ever tried that technique out that's so cool but i had a, I had a very clear vision to do it like oh that sounds like my arp synthesizer why wouldn't it be funny 
and and they looked at me like well, you're crazy you know we don't do overdubs we don't do doubles i said just try this thing detune your strings the t- just a touch play it again and tell me if you like this and everybody like oh, that's cool that's dope man so if since i mean i'm, I'm surprised because they came out really well why haven't you tried that since then i don't know I usually try something if it, the idea, you know, like this is calling for that. This needs that. So I haven't had the feeling of, oh, I want to do it again. I haven't heard it. I haven't recorded a guitar player playing a melody like that. Mm-hmm. That's for sure. Gotcha. I hear you. Yeah. So when you heard the final version of that song, what did you think of it? I mean, I guess the guitar part, would it be fair to say that's the most important part of that track in particular? Uh, like everything else, you know, their music is counterpoint. It's not normal rock and roll with a rhythm guitar and a guy putting a couple leads in between the vocals. And, you know, it's like everything in melody. There's three or four melodies happening on every song, the voice, the bass, the two guitars, and even the drum is a bit melodic. Hmm. So it's very strangely written music. It's not like normal rock and roll. It's just the writing of it made the song special and the band's dedication to really playing it like their life depended on it. That's so cool. So because that was an experimental thing you were doing, when you were doing it, were you sure if it was going to work out or were you thinking, hey, this might not work out, but let's give it a shot? What was your mindset there? Whenever I try something, I'm always sure it's going to sound awesome, but I never know if the band is going to like smile okay. or just thumbs <laughs> down. And ultimately, they're the ones I'm trying to trying to get them on board yeah if they thought that was a stupid idea and really cheesy and just ruined the song it would have been erased in one second okay. but when they heard that they smiled and thumbs up that's awesome so do you remember producing barely legal i thought it was uh it was curious it's like so strange you know the storyline and that i like many of his things they're like Things that you could get a picture on each line, but why would those lines fit together? You know, like, why won't he wear his new trench coat or whatever? You know, like, (laughs) where is this coming from? What's it all mean? It sounds cool, but what is he talking about? And what if, I don't know. I thought it was really super challenging, very poetic, really liked that song. That's cool. And how about the song, The Modern Age? You said you were a fan of that one. What in particular did you like about Uh, that? I just like the lilt on it. I like the, just the, the power and... You know, they're playing really, they're playing these kind of straight rhythms and offbeat rhythms, and they're doing it so almost mechanically, almost like a machine is doing it. They're they're so good with the rhythms, Albert and Nick, and they made such a groove on that Mm -hmm. that it's just undeniable. So do you you recall working on that one in the studio? Do you recall recording that particular track? I recall, recall both times, yeah. And what was it like? Could you walk me through it a little bit? Uh, well, basically, was, okay, so I think that was the first song that they recorded in, in the, for the EPs. So it was actually the first moment I ever recorded them. That's cool. I saw them at the show, and as I said, they weren't my favorite band. I didn't really, I, I didn't really pick up on what they were doing. I just thought, okay, whatever. Mm-hmm. But they're coming to my studio, set up the mics, make sure they like the sound. Okay, what are you going to play now? They go out and they start playing that, and they play it five or six or seven or ten times in a row, and by time three i'm going this is cool man this i didn't have any idea what the vocals were going to be like i just heard the music and i thought this is really something that these offbeat rhythms and this this jam that they're doing is so good and then when he started singing it wow it's just like whoa he's this young guy and he sounds like an ancient guy who's been through the mill you know he just sounds like some old guy has been through it you know hmm so when the Modern Age EP was released, there was a lot of buzz around the band. Did you guys expect that to happen or did that kind of catch you by surprise? I'll speak for myself. <laughs> like that thing was a demo, you know, because they were playing free shows, you know, trying to get publicity in the Lower East Side and the East Village. And so they made a demo because maybe they could get into the next level of clubs, you know, and maybe... Uh, not lose the money on the taxis going to the show or whatever. And so it was never intended to be something that people would play or that would, you know, be popular. It was just something that it was a demo to get them better gigs. As far as I know, they, they hired me to make a demo. That's so cool. And it just kind of took off. That's amazing. 
I'm curious, the versions of The Modern Age, Last Night, and Barely Legal that are on the EP, are those the same ones that are, end up on Is This It? No, not at all. The same songs, but, um, you know, they were also, as I said, trying to, they, I made them a three-day, three-song deal. That was my thing at the time. I got cheap rates. I got a good studio. Come try me. I think you'll like it. Three days, three songs. I think it's something like... 300 a day or something like that. Oh, yeah. I don't think they thought that they were going to get the reaction that they, that they got from it. That's for sure. That's awesome. So the Modern Age EP was released in January of 01, January 29th. And then their debut record, This Is It, was recorded between March to April of 01. So it was a quick turnaround. From the point of release of the EP to the recording of This Is It, the LP, was there immediate hype? Is that what you guys wanted to capture? Or, like, why did you guys go into the studio so quickly? It had more to do with them. The story is much more centered around them. I was in my studio working with other bands, but I was seeing all this wave of publicity coming in from the UK. You know, it was, I, I always read UK magazines, you know, uh, Melody Maker when it was around, yeah. NME. There was a magazine shop right down from my studio, I'd always go there and pour through the music magazines and people told me, Hey, you got to check out NME. You know, that demo you made is like in there, dude, they picked it as record of the week. And they're like, what? (laughs) You know, I can't believe it. And so they basically on the strength of that act reaction to the, to the EP, they went to England to tour to, you know, did they played shows, club shows. They weren't even playing above 14th street in New York. Nobody knew where they were yet. They were in kind of demand to go around. Um, and they were signed. The EP got signed on a on rough trade. They were running with the ball and getting to go overseas. Uh, and of course, that generated just a lot of like, whoa, what's happening? This band from our town, from these small clubs is over in England. Like nobody, nobody could say that. Like that was like not unheard of. Completely unheard of. That's so cool. So how did the EP get released? You mentioned Rough Trade now, but I mean, when the band first finished the EP, how did they get it out there? Was it immediately picked up by Rough Trade? Well, right around the time I was meeting them, there was a young guy about their age who was really interested in managing them. And he worked at one of the kind of most trendy clubs for live music in the East Village, the Lower East Side, called Mercury Lounge which was mostly a place where signed artists came from other places to tour and do showcases for the New York music industry. So it was kind of a bit of a snobby kind of, I didn't really love shows there. It was very good sound, but it was always kind of like industry people with their arms crossed, you know, mostly checking out the other industry people, not necessarily looking at the band, you know, if that guy's interested, I better do something kind of thing. And so, the guy, Ryan Gentles, was he worked uh, at the Mercury Lounge and his boss, um, he went to his boss and said, look, the band I want to manage just made this demo. Do you have any leads for me? And because Mercury Lounge is such a pivotal place for bands to come through and labels to showcase, he sent it off to Rough Trade. To the best of my knowledge, that's how it happened. He sent the demo off to Rough Trade just to see what they would say about it. That's so cool. And so, I mean, obviously the band was very satisfied with the work you did because they went back to you for, is this it? Uh, did you, yeah. did you have a feeling they were going to come back to you or like, how did that all come together? I'll, I'll just reiterate kind of a point I was making earlier. Rock music wasn't very popular. Okay. So I thought they would, when I made the EP and I had them in my studio, I could really see how tight they were and how interesting the songs were. And also I was kind of flabbergasted because they were referencing music that me and my friends growing up listened to. But why would kids of their age know about like the Velvet Underground or the Stooges? Like nobody talked about those bands. Even when those bands were com- were releasing records, they weren't popular bands and they got dropped because like kind of no one was really interested in that music even at the time. Hmm. But me and my friends, a lot of underground rockers all over the U.S. and the world, we listen to that music. And to hear these young 20-year-old kids kind of doing it in that spirit, I was really impressed. Like, how do they hear it? Who played this music for them? And why do they think it's important? Hmm. That was really running through my mind. And the other thing that was running through my mind is, man, 
they should have been around about 10 years ago at the beginning of the grunge scene because rock and roll, that was the last moment for rock. And I happened to be from Seattle, so I was That's there. Cool. <laughs> and I felt, I felt like these guys, you know, if they – if, if a guy at an a and r at a label in New York hears, puts on the tape and hears an electric guitar strumming, they're just going to toss it in the trash can. They're just going to be like, this is, what are we going to do with this? This is like so far behind the times. This isn't jungle. It's not pop. It's not all this electro stuff. And so I didn't expect to hear from them, even though I thought their music was super cool. That's amazing. So now they do end up going back to you. What was the recording process like for Is This It? How was, how did that all, were you, were you like anticipating, okay, this could be a big record? Like, was that kind of thing in the background at all? I think that by that time, as you said, it was only, they released it in late January. If they came to me in April, that's January, February, uh, March, April, I don't know, it's a couple months later, whatever. In those couple months, there was already so much fire buzz, you know, it was like the whole world is kind of talking about that last thing we did. And they're kind of waiting to see what we're going to come up with as an album. I never had that feeling either. I always had the feeling like we're going into the basement. We're going to work really hard and God knows how we're going to get it out in the world. But this one was like, dude, do you realize that if we do a good job with this, that everybody's going to hear it the minute it comes out. So and sick. It, it was it was great and for me it was like party time that was like party time like wow i'm so happy about this i'm so excited for them they had a completely different kind of they were excited but they're so they're so focused and they're so serious about their music they're like we have a large responsibility to do our music <laughs> accurately. you know we need to we have one shot and we better work as hard as possible to make sure we take advantage of this opportunity. You know, these young guys are like that serious awesome. about their rock and roll. I, I was impressed. That's so cool. So I got to ask you, man, I've read, maybe this isn't correct, but I've read that during the making of Is This It, the band would often be very drunk. Was this Is this true or is this an exaggeration? The band, I've, I've heard even them say stuff like, Man, I was so drunk. I don't even remember doing that stuff. You know, I don't really, it's all a big fun. But you know what? They were drinking beer. Nobody was throwing up. Nobody was unconscious. Nobody was playing slop. They were all playing like their life depended on it with a click track, like totally nailing it, like pushing everything, focusing like laser beams. That's awesome. So I don't know how you could possibly be drunk and be that tight and serious and focused. Like if one little thing went by, for example, Julian might drink nine beers. You know, there might be nine empties, but if one hi-hat was slightly out of time, he would be like, dude, what's that rush? Why do we have to have that? Can we please do it again? You know, there was like nothing like floating by. It was all bang. That's awesome. So yeah. what was it like working with them in the studio? The first EP was, you said it was over three days you guys did the EP. So this is right. the first time with, uh, is this it? They actually have like kind of an extended period to work with them over the course of a month or whatever. Were you kind of experimenting with which types of mics to use? What's the best setup? Or did you already have an idea as to what would be the best thing? It's a combination of two things. One is that we realized not only did they get a great reaction on that kind of sound we had before, which was the sound of eight microphones. You know, we only, I only had one 888 at the time, okay. which is the interface. So I could only use eight mics to record a rock band. And they didn't do overdubs. They didn't do layers. They didn't do doubles. So what you basically hear on the EP is eight tracks of music and one track of vocals done separately. Mm. So we kind of thought, you know, people are flipping out about this sound that's just so direct and so stripped down. Hmm. And we're going to kind of, we're going to, we're going to go with that because this is, and they also liked that sound. They thought that was really cool. That was very different than what everyone else was doing, where suddenly with digital audio, you could make the biggest productions in history. Hmm. You know, you could, you could have like the previous sound that only Michael Jackson could have with two tape decks linked together. Hmm. You could just do that with Pro Tools now. And everybody was. So we knew we wanted to keep very similar sound, but within that, 
I would experiment with what, which mic I was using and where I was going to place it. If there was a solo, I'd think, well, I know I want to do a room mic, but what if I try this mic for the room mic and I put it like against the wall in a corner, you know, I, or cool. do, I, did, I did really crazy stuff as often as I could when I thought it might work out well. And it usually worked out well. I didn't ever have to like, oh, that's not working. Let's try. I didn't do a lot of trial and error. I would just like stick something somewhere and adjust some knobs, some compression, you know, some volume, some overdrive, and everybody would go like, yeah, that's cool. That's, that's cool. Sick. When the record finally gets released, I believe it was released in the summer. Like, I think it was July of 01 that Is This It came out. The record comes out. It ends up becoming really successful. What was that like for you personally? Just like on a personal level, seeing like the EP did well. That was cool. Now the album is doing really well. What was that like? Right. Well, first of all, in between, in between the the EP and the album coming out, and in between the album, you know, kind of being recorded and coming out, we have nine eleven. Hmm. Okay, so everyone's head is all messed up, especially us New Yorkers. You know, it was like we're kind of like in a different space now. We're thinking about a lot of stuff, like what's going on? Is that going to happen again? Wasn't that a night? Like, everybody was kind of still reeling from that in two thousand one. And so the record comes out against this kind of backdrop of the world is going through a weird phase. Something's something. This is a new level of reality we don't know about yet in the U.S. And so, yeah, when the record comes out, I think it came out in Australia, then either UK or Japan at the same time. And it didn't come out for in America for a while longer, hmm. you know. So it didn't come out in America in July of 01. It came out afterwards. It came after 9-11. Really? It, it was supposed to come out like that same week. It was supposed to come out right at that time. And like 9-11 impacted that album directly because they had, they took this one of the best songs off the album because of consideration for what was going on. New York City Cops wasn't on the American release of the album. Mm. They made a new song like a week or two before the album came out. They came back in my studio and recorded a brand new song that they put on instead mm. when it started, it's called. So yeah, that's another level of just so bizarre. Like we changed the album. The album is delayed. And you can imagine that I think there were warehouses full of the original pressing of the album that they had to like kind of either scrap or put aside for the future because they weren't going to, they had to repress the album. So, I mean, against the backdrop of all that, I guess, was it a kind of a bright spot in your life when it started? It was a major major bright spot, major bright spot, because even when the first single came out, hard to explain and, um, I think New York City Cops came out before that in June in England. And man, people were just loving it. The fever pitch was rising. Like that single did another boost. You know, it was like another level of craziness. Mm -hmm. And then they went to play those festivals in Europe that summer and everywhere. They were like being moved from the little stages to the big stages. They had to be. So yeah, it was a major bright spot for sure. An awesome time. That's cool. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. That's that's amazing. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's nuts. Actually, one of my friend's dad died in in one of the buildings. It's, it's crazy. Yeah, oh, yeah. I didn't no. know about that till like years later too. So I mean, the record came out great. It gets released after 11 Things are getting better. It's taken off. Was there any sort of expectation that you would do the next record as well, or how did that all come together? The second record. Um. Well, I figured that because we had so much. Kind of, we worked well together as a team, I thought, and I think that they also believed. I had a feeling from them that it was a good team, mm-hmm. and there was a lot of good vibes. And obviously, they toured for a couple of years in a row after that. They were just in demand, playing night after night around the world, around the world, buses, planes, very little so cool. time off. Yeah. So I was kind of like looking at the calendar, going like. You know, is it should be time for a new album pretty soon. You know, I, I'm waiting for a phone call, waiting for a phone call. And I think it took longer than I thought um, because I thought maybe a year later they'd make a record. But I think it was a couple of years later that we, we made the record. Yeah, it was released in October of 03. And it, it was, right. I looked up the stats. It said it was recorded in 03. It doesn't specifically state what point in the year. So you're getting yeah. as good as mine. I remember it was summer. So, I mean, that's a quick turnaround then that you guys recorded it in the summer. It was already out a couple months later. Interesting. I thought in my book, I actually said like, whoa, 
when I, when I had to research, I had to do research for my book. Like, when did we record that? <laughs> when did you know? I had to do all this? Where was I that year? But yeah, I remember thinking, wait, we finished it in like early September and somewhere in October, they're already sending out like promo copies and yeah. a single. You know, it's like, that's in the music industry of that time. That's very fast yeah. turnaround. So when you guys are recording this this uh, second record, you know, Room on Fire, during the first record, obviously there was the hype with the EP, so, you know, things were a little bit exciting. Now it's more than hype. Now you guys had that first record out there. It did really, really well. Uh, what was the vibe like in the studio for the second record? Was it nervous at all, or was it like, we got this? Like, what was the feeling? Well, there's a lot of feelings. The first one is that we recorded the EP and the album one in my studio. And by the time the second album has come out, I'm already living in England Hmm. and I don't have a studio in New York anymore. So we had to use kind of a stranger studio. They they had to go into a studio that they weren't familiar with. And that was kind of like a little bit like a a little cold for them. You know, like they, they like it when it's something they love that they have good luck with. And so I tried to make that studio as comfortable as Paul. I tried to put elements of design and, comfort in that studio i spent some time trying to make it seem like my basement studio and so that was one emotional element the second emotional element was they were such a different band by the time they got to me on the second album playing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows made this band tight like they were tight and monstrous they were gigantic sounding and when they came to me on the first album they were really interesting and they worked hard to be tight but they were kind of like young and like kind of, it was, they weren't like these, they weren't the musicians they were when they walked in for album two, like mm. this hardcore, it was more like Zeppelin. That's you cool. know, they played me, they played me the album. They said, sit down, we're going to play you what we want to record. And they played me the songs and I was just jaw dropped. Like what? Watching Nick play those solos, watching Albert's rhythm and Fab's rhythm be just like so much higher than it had been before. I was like, wow, this is a force. And yeah, then there was a psychology of like, okay, we have this album that everybody loves. What are we going to do? You know, how can we possibly cope with it? We just pretend that we we don't know? Or, you know, are we we fighting against ourselves to try to top it? It was a a bit psychological. And um, it turned into, they were already a little bit pressurized on the first album because they thought we might have a chance. Well, on the second one, they're like, ah, how are we going to live up mm. to the first album? How are we going to beat it? How are we going to like impress people again? Can we do it? That's really cool. So when you, I guess, as the producer were making this record, was there any extra pressure on you to be like even more meticulous with all the different stuff you're working on? On both records, other than the sheer amount of effort and concentration and physical stamina I needed to work that many days, those long hours, it was really overall extremely like awesome and spectacular. I'm sitting there, this big, this one was a big studio with a huge SSL board, big speakers, a huge live room, a collection of microphones, you know, and preamps that were just beyond my wildest dreams. So it was like, and I had assistant engineers and engineers. So I had help. It was really hard work, but I was super into it. Like I thought it sounded phenomenal. My favorite's Under Control. Oh, okay. I mean, that song is just, just bizarre sounding. Hmm. To me, it sounds like the room is wobbling. It's just a bunch of people playing in a room, but it sounds like it's like kind of taking off. It's like getting ready to take off. It's a very strange third dimensional sound that's created because of the walls and the band playing together that song really captured uh something in the room that was happening so in general you were saying a little bit earlier how because there was now this expectation that this is going to be a good record there was i don't know if it was more pressure but there was more awareness so to speak of like we know this is going to take off when this gets released so when the album's finished and it's getting out there were you guys like full of anticipation? Were you a little bit anxious? What was the feeling leading into the release? I think that the band had a very strong feeling during that album that it wasn't like, oh, this is going to take off. It's going to be a blow away. They thought, you know, we really like these songs. They're really good. But is the world going to react to that? They didn't know. I think they were apprehensive, to be honest with you. I think they were like, 
you know, is the world going to like this as much as the first album? Are we going to get that reaction again? And I also think they were like, are we going to have to tour for two more years? Mm. Do we have to go back on the road for two years? I think there was some apprehension and pressure on the band. Mm. Um, it wasn't like jumping up and down and clicking their heels together, but neither, neither was Is This It, to be honest. They were like excited and focused, but they weren't like smashing the bottles together and like, we really did it. Oh yeah, we're... They were just real serious. So when the record gets released, what were your thoughts on like the reception in particular for like the release of Reptilia? That song just took off. What did you think about all that? I'm not sure I was really aware of how it was doing. Hmm. Uh, one thing was that I was living in England and I had noticed that the European and English audiences were way, way far ahead of the, of the American audience for loving the strokes and being fans and being vocal and being in love with it. Hmm. So at the beginning of it, of Room on Fire, I think that U.S. was like starting to like just starting to kind of get on board. You know, it wasn't just L.A. anymore and New York. It was like kind of it was getting to be an American thing. They were starting to do well in America, but they were, it wasn't like they were not at the top. They were still having to do a lot of work to kind of conquer America. They went on tour with, I think, Kings of Leon and really played heavily around the U.S. So I think they were really trying to like, come on, let, why can't we make America as excited about us as mm. the U.K. is like dropping dead when we go there? What do you think was that turning point where they finally kind of broke through in America? I don't know. I think that enough people finally had seen them live somewhere around the first tour of Room on Fire, that this thing that people had heard about a little bit or finally they'd seen it and they were telling their friends. And also the internet, the way it had developed as a message sending device in, in 2000 and 2001, early 2001, when we were making the, is this, the, the internet was still pretty, you know, formative, mm -hmm. you know, the, and by 2003, it was starting to become a major deal. So the, I think the internet helping spread the, I just saw this band in my town. You've got to go see. I think people were spreading the message on a grassroots level, mm. using the internet. And they finally all that touring was paying off and they were starting to get the kind of the respect and the admiration in the U.S. that I, I think they'd been working towards for a number of years. It was like, I hope it does well. I hope it does well. Oh, look. Wow, look at my royalty check. Okay, and that's cool. Is this, is this it? It's really doing great. And so is Room on Fire at the same time. This is like the highlight. This is awesome. Two records by this group that are like out there, you know, converting hearts and minds all over the world big time. It was a major good thing for me. Awesome. And especially I was living in England, which was a dream come true of being in the British scene, working with British bands and just the cloud of having these two records that I produced is like really good for my career. So now I guess we're into the third record. You guys have two records already done that are doing very well. So I guess with this third album, was there already, was there like an expectation like, okay, we did it twice. Like this one's going to do well as two. Like what was the vibe like for number three? Number three was very different because we actually started the process together and they didn't have songs written. So I was there okay. from the very beginning of the songwriting process this time, which was very unusual for me and for them. So it was done a completely different way. I think it was a very different time in the world, a different time in the music business in the world, and a different time in the Strokes' personal sphere. I was fired during that record. Did you know that? I did not know that, no. Well, I do know that uh -huh. there was two, I was gonna ask you, there's two producers, is that why that happened? Yeah, I was let I was let go very early in the in the um, in the recording of that album, and they used David Kahn, a very experienced and professional producer of long term stature. You know, super music guy. They decided they wanted to try his production on that album, and hmm. I was kind of asked if I would mind stepping down. Hmm. Sorry to hear that, man. I mean. Was that, I, I'm, I'm assuming that was a surprise to you when that happened? Um, it was a, the whole, the process of working on the demos with them. And then right at the beginning of the album being recorded, 
kind of like working with, I worked with David on a few songs. Like there's a few songs on first impressions that have my name as well as his. But very soon after he took over and I, I was off to Mexico and England to and Berlin to record bands there on my own. Interesting. So, I mean, if, if you don't want to discuss, it's totally up to you. But did your relationship with the band suffer because of this? Like, did you, were you amicable or how did that all play out? Very amicable. Because I come to music as a musician and a composer and a songwriter. You know, I, I learned how to record doing my own songs. And the last thing I would want to do is work with someone that I decided, actually, I don't want to be working with you right now. Mm. I would not want to have that person in my band. So when they told it to me, it was a bit of a shock. Mm -hmm. I was sad. But this is their music. This is their decision. I have plenty of things I can do. They put me in an excellent position. I respect them and love them forever for being part of my journey. And on we go. The future started then, you know. These guys, I had such great regard for them. And I have great regard for artists. So it was like a personal thing that I could see why, you know, I could, a professional, I've been contracted for this. My lawyer is going to wait till my lawyer finds out about this. You guys will be sorry. That's a professional kind of thing. Personal is like, yeah, I can see where you're coming from. If you want to try something new, God bless you. You know, you're an artist. You need to try something new. Yeah, I'm a little stung. I'm not going to be getting the royalty check for this album. I'm not going to be known as the guy who produced the third album. But you know what? That I will deal with and let's go. I hear you know, it was a personal, it's kind of a personal thing. I hear you. Was there any signs that it was like just a total out of nowhere kind of deal? Like, do you know why they didn't want to work with your sound anymore? Like, what was the different sound they were looking for? I think they wanted to try a different approach. Hmm. Um, you know, a different, a different whole philosophy of recording, a different sonic outcome. I have a definite philosophy of recording and I have kind of a definite sonic outcome and one would not say that my salt my uh my reputation or my type of production is like extremely professional incredibly huge you know so perfect it's nothing none of those words like my stuff is like kind of wow it's kind of strange it's kind of interesting uh, it's kind of full of excitement and freaky stuff is happening all the time, you know, and they had three albums, three records with that on it. And maybe they wanted to try somebody that was like, you know, I know when things are accurately done and uh, we, we can make this sound huge and professional together, guys. You know, something like that. I don't know. I wasn't there for those discussions, but that's the kind of producer I am. Hey, fair enough, mm-hmm. man. Fair enough. So, I mean, you said that some of the stuff you worked on did end up on First Impressions. Uh, do you recall yes. what it was? Like, do you recall which songs exactly that you had a hand? I believe in? I believe there's like like Electricity Scape. I might have a credit. You can see the credit somewhere. I think Heart in a Cage. Uh, I don't remember. I did all the songs as demos hmm. with the band, and then when they re-recorded it, I was there for like the beginning of three of the songs. Interesting. Do you remember recording the demo for Heart in a Cage? Yeah, I remember that because it's such a strange lyric. Yeah, it's such a strange lyric. And what what was that like? Like, what did you think of the song? Like, what did you think of the demo version? And then if you heard the final version, what how would you compare the two? The one sounded sound like a Gordon Raphael production. It's kind of like all over the place mm-hmm. and a bit like, you know, unusual. And one was like super gigantic and like in your face powerful rock and roll with gigantic drum sounds <laughs> interesting yeah hey, that's fair enough man so i mean yeah. like, do you remember recording the demo for juice box yeah and what yeah. was that what was that process like well all those demos were very slow like you come in record one day a little idea and then come back a couple weeks later record the next part so they were all kind of done piece by piece the demos were done like in little sections and built up like painted Mm-hmm. in whereas the album was kind of like more like they already had the song and they had a framework to work mm-hmm. from the songs were very new and under formation when i was working on them hmm. do you remember working on the demo for electricity scape yeah for sure what was that like 
oh, I just remember just the riff and the speed and tempo of it and trying to get these wild guitar sounds is just really bright and ripping. So, yeah, and I love the time, the time feeling of that. It's just really rolling. So just out of curiosity, when was the next time that you got in touch with the band again? Like, when did you reconnect? Let's see, after, after First Impressions, I don't know. I think I probably saw them out on the road, or maybe I didn't see them again until, like, Julian's solo album or Albert were having solo albums and coming through Berlin. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember seeing them then. I don't know if I saw any First Impressions. I might have seen a First Impressions show in Berlin. That's cool. So, I mean, you, you mentioned that between from Is This It to Room on Fire. With Room on Fire, you use a few more mics than Is This It. Right. With the demos for uh, for First Impressions, was it the same miking approach you were doing? Or, like, did you progressively use more mics with each time you saw them? Well, one of the interesting things that I got to do for First Impressions was that band hired me to come before the demo start and build them a studio. Really? So I already built a couple studios co-built and built my own studios. I co-built the transport around where we made uh, Is This It and Modern Age. And I built my own studio in London. But now I had like the stroke size budget to build a dream studio. And so I knew exactly if I had a, a budget like that, I knew exactly what to get. I got all this incredible stuff that I really love using. And basically I did it the same way as the other records, just with uh, a really fine, fine collection of microphones and preamps. That's so cool. So what ended up happening to that studio that you built? I don't know. I, th- I, I imagine that they recorded a lot of first impressions there, and they might have – it was in their practice room that they had for many gotcha. years. Okay, so cool. that, 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 that space in the music building on the west side of New York, I think it had a lot of sentimental attachment as some place they kind of come up in. And I don't know how long that studio lasted. I don't know if it's still there. I don't really know much. Hmm. So did you have ownership of any of the gear or was that all through the label? I brought some of my own gear um, just for fun, but they had all, they had all their gear, you know, all that stuff in that studio that they bought was hundred percent theirs. That's cool. That's cool. I'm just curious. Cause you were saying like you knew which stuff you would get if you had the dream budget, this, the yeah. budget I'm assuming it was supplied by the label. Like it wasn't your direct deposit or anything nobody told me where the check was coming from okay they had me come over on a business meeting to meet the guys and said we want you to build us a studio (laughs) and i go oh wow that's really cool who do i talk to about the budget talk to ryan let's go so i went home and i called ryan i said hey ryan i got this idea for a studio here's the list of equipment i know where to buy it in the u.s they can ship it to new york Mm -hmm. tell me if this is okay yeah it's okay Ryan is their manager. He's not their manager now, but he was through the entire time I ever worked with them. Do you know why the band went on hiatus by any chance? I have some theories of my own. I would say that probably Julian, who is a very adventurous composer, had some ideas of things he wanted to try out, which later became his solo album and The Voids. Hmm. Okay. You couldn't imagine the Strokes playing, like the Strokes were not the kind of band as the Voids, Hmm. you know? And so I think he just wanted to do that. And so while he was working on that, you know, Albert also said, I want to, I love writing songs. He started a solo career. Fab was with Little Joy for a while. And Nikolai had two bands of his own and Nick had his own band. I think they just all, you know, found things to do while people were writing their own songs. These first two records, the EP and the third record, First Impressions of Earth, did the band hire you directly to produce or was it through the label? Like, How did that happen exactly? It was always the band. I mean, I don't think I've hardly ever been hired by a label, almost never in my whole career. It was always a band or a musician talks to me. Most bands I've recorded don't have labels or even managers, so they talk to me directly. Mm. And in this case, the Strokes after the first album, Mm -hmm. they would talk to me directly through their manager at first to set up the business. And then they would talk to me about their artistic ideas and the label would fund it. That's interesting. It's interesting. The reason I ask is I did an interview a while back with Steve Albini about In Utero. And he told me that uh, Nirvana hired him directly and the label wasn't happy because the label wanted somebody else because Albini's sound wasn't really like the polished sound, so to speak. So 
Like, the label basically went after him afterwards to kind of try to ruin his career. Like, all this crazy stuff. So I'm just curious, like, so when you're producing The Stroke, because you're outside of the label, does the label then get to polish up your work? Or whatever you do is what they have to put out there. How does that work exactly? Well, there's some dynamite stories in my book about cool. okay. <laughs> exactly this topic, about how The Strokes label uh, enjoyed me as a producer. But I will say that they were not happy at first and they were very vocal about getting rid of me. Hmm. And then after the first album, I didn't have to deal with that from them. I didn't, I didn't have any of that for the second album. That's cool. That's cool to hear. Why did the band end up signing with RCA? Do you know why they chose that label in particular? They were auditioning American labels during the first week of recording Is This It. Hmm. So I had privy to be setting up the computer, overhearing them talking about the labels they went out to dinner with the night before. All the labels cool. were trying to sign them. Wasn't that guy a phony? I just hated that guy. He just was lying the whole time he was talking. They just were having really disgusting reactions to all these label people that they were meeting. Mm. And then one day they said, you know what? We went out to dinner with this guy from RCA and it seemed like he really likes the band. Like we could tell he likes the music and he wants us on the label. So he was the one guy, they were the one guy set of guys that didn't like turn their stomach. The name of my book is up from the basement with the strokes. That's cool. You know, that's cool. and it's kind of like, that's the feeling like, I'm down in the basement every day recording whatever bands are coming through, having a great time. But, you know, who knows how you get music out in the big world? And wouldn't it be interesting to go to see another city or work in other places yeah. and travel and kind of have people know about me, walk down the street and have people say, that's the guy who produced the Strokes that's album. Cool. Like that, that was always, a, I was wondered what that would be like. And I got to experience that. Um, with the release of Is This It and Room on Fire and Regina's Soviet Kitsch album. All three of those records kind of gave me the ability to live a different kind of life. And here we are in the year 2022, and I'm still getting calls from bands all over the world that love <laughs> the strokes and Regina Spector that want me to record their album. This 21 years later, people are still reacting by calling me to mix or produce something based on that music, which is just jaw-droppingly exciting and uh, humbling and a blessing, you know? That's really, really cool. So, I mean, I guess for you personally, like, was it also kind of a sense of like vindication? All these years of struggle, it finally paid off. Was there a feeling like that for you? There was definitely a feeling like all those years of making strange sounds and in people's basements and garages and just like, dedicating my whole life to like tweaking with knobs and putting tones together. It's like, finally I made something with a group of people that um, people are smiling about and patting me on the back. And like, I'm even making a living. I'm able to pay my rent and travel and buy equipment and make my own studios. So I was really happy that I had done all those steps of working with sound and music, you know, so now, I mean, the band is, they're out there touring on this, on Rue on Fire, the second record. At this point, are you guys like, uh, I mean, because cell phones are still kind of relatively primitive at the time, but were you guys like keeping in touch at all, like during the in-between periods between records? Mm, most of the time, the way I'd keep in touch is if, like, I knew they were going to play in Seattle. So I'd fly from England to Seattle to see them in my hometown and bring my mom and dad or, uh, you know, bring people or I'd see them in Berlin, I'd see them in England. So I'd go to their shows and I'd get to go hang out with them backstage and catch up with them. But I really never had, had a relationship with them where we're like, hey man, what'd you eat for breakfast today? Hey, how's it going? Which town are you in, guys? It's like I was off working with other bands and they were doing their stuff. I was working on my own music or touring with my own bands. They were doing their things. And yet, there was always this really good feeling when I would see them. There's always a friendly camaraderie, like brotherhood kind of thing. Mm -hmm. that's, that I think it's still going on. That's good to hear. So going back to the Modern Age EP, when you work on something like that from an unknown band and then there's all this buzz around it, what does that feel like for you? I guess I've been working in the music industry for a couple of decades uh, before that moment happened. 
and uh, making lots of music, playing lots of shows. And I never experienced, I always thought that there could be something like that. That reaction is what you'd kind of want from the world. Mm -hmm. So when I worked with the Strokes and that happened, it was kind of the very first time I ever felt that in something I was associated with. And it was kind of monumental. It was something I was looking forward to. And I certainly didn't expect it from that demo. Hmm. I was very surprised, but also it was a feeling like I've never had before. And in some ways never had since. It was just a moment in time of extreme excitement for sure. That's so cool. I mean, a lot of people can't, can't, would never be able to say they did that. So that's, that's amazing. You got to actually be part of something like that. So how did the Strokes hear about you in particular? I mean, you guys are both in, I'm assuming, New York City. Is that how you guys came across each other? Basically, I was in New York City with my band called Absinthe. Mm -hmm. And we were looking for somebody that could really do a good job booking shows for us. Because like all the other bands at that time, bands weren't the most popular thing mm -hmm. in town at that time. In the year 1999, 2000, you know, electronic, jungle, hip hop, um, acid jazz, that's what everybody was talking about. And that's what was everywhere. Bands were kind of like a holdover and a bit out of fashion, but there was a bit of a scene from bands that had moved to New York from all over the world, trying to make it together, trying to figure out what to do. Hmm. And usually what they did is there were three or four clubs on Ludlow Street that they could play at. That was about it. There wasn't a lot of other options for playing your own music as a band in New York at that time. Hmm. So I met this booking agent through one of my band members named Carrie Black. Yep. And she said, come to this party at Luna Lounge. Uh, you can see what I do in case you want me to book your band. And so two bands played and I was ready with my business cards for each band. I went up after the show and said, hey, I've got a studio really close by. I can make a good demo at a good price. I think you'll like it. And the first band which is actually the band I preferred that night, did not call me. Hmm. And uh, Albert Albert called me from the Strokes a day or two later. <laughs> well, things work out really interestingly. You know, one of the interesting things about, that's what I was about to say about Radiohead, about uh, the Strokes, is that Albert's father, you know, he had the song, The Air That I Breathe, that inspired Creep. Was there any connection between Radiohead and the Strokes at all? Like, did they ever interact in any way? I remember going to Tokyo where the Strokes and uh, Radiohead co-headlined a giant festival. Um, so for me, that that's the only thing I know that they have in, in common. I think at one point I remember Julian telling me that he really liked the sound of some Radiohead albums. After Is This It was out, mm. he told me he really liked some of the production on the Radiohead records. That's really cool. So was there any was there any mention at all ever about Creep in particular? Because there is that connection between Albert and that song. I've never I never heard the word Radiohead. Did you know about that though? The connection that's between the two of them? Never, never I don't. I don't. Yeah, it's cool. So basically the story there is uh, Tom York, he based Creep off the song The Air That I Breathe, which is a song by the Hollies, which is Albert's father. So Albert's father's label or manager or something, they ended up suing Radiohead for the song. So now Albert's dad gets payments for Creep whenever it gets cool. played. Even though Albert's dad, is, he's actually said publicly, like, I feel bad about this. This is not my call. I didn't want this to happen. But yeah, such as... I, I, actually, I, I remember that song. I remember the Holly song, The Air That I Breathe. That's very, I, I mean, I didn't know Albert Hammond's dad wrote it. I knew he wrote It Never Rains in Southern California. I think so, yeah. I, yeah, I know that song by him, but I didn't know The Air That I Breathe is by yeah, him, it's cool. too. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. That's cool. So, I mean, I also heard... Um, that the band are big fans of the Arctic Monkeys. Is this is this correct? Did they ever talk about that? Uh, I never spoke with them about the Arctic Monkeys, but I saw the Arctic Monkeys live in Berlin in one of their very first shows, like very early in their career. Mm -hmm. And I sat beside the stage and I'm like, whoa, Alex Turner can sure play the guitar. And that guy, Matt, can sure play the drums like nobody's business. You know, like I could see why penultimate musicians like the Strokes would respect the musicianship and songwriting and vocals of the Arctic Monkeys, I could see why. And everybody everybody knows that the Arctic Monkeys uh, are in love with the Strokes as well. Okay, so it's a, it's a mutual respect. That's cool. I like that. So when it came to producing the Strokes, would it be fair to say that your approach to them in the studio was somewhat experimental? I kind of built my whole musical outlook on experimenting. 
Hmm. I was never like, even when I was in cover bands, I never liked to play the same thing twice. And all my, many of my favorite records are filled with improvisation, whether it's Hendrix or Miles Davis hmm. or whatever. I just really like improv. And because I worked for a couple of decades playing music and recording music in this improvisatory way, I kind of learned a lot of tricks. And I also learned that if you try things, usually it can work out well. It's, it's not often that I try a musical experiment and it kind of sounds bad. Hmm. It's like, oh, that's interesting. And if it doesn't sound interesting, I could turn it up louder or I could push the mic further away. There's, I, I always know how to compensate if I get in a bit of, if it's not as good as I want it to be. Yeah. I'm, al I'm always looking for each sound to be like, wow, what is that? That's crazy. Even though it's an electric guitar, how come it sounds that way? You know, I, yeah. I like just finding new, new ways. That's so cool. So were there any, was there anything unique you did recording wise in terms of your techniques with the strokes that you hadn't done before? Or were these all different things you've already practiced before, more or less? The main technique that I, there are two techniques that I had to work on. And uh, I got very good at it over the seven weeks that we recorded the album. The first technique was listening to people very clearly when they asked for something, mm. instead of just assuming that I knew more because I had more experience in the studio. If they wanted something turned up, even though I thought maybe that's not a great idea, I would turn it up to see if they liked it that way. And I would also turn it up to see what I would learn from doing that. Mm. So listening to other people's suggestions was a new technique for listening that carefully and because you know they they really wanted me to know that they had a lot of ideas and they didn't want somebody to try to talk them out of their ideas they wanted someone who could show them what their ideas sounded like so they could make the final decision on whether they liked it the second technique was having the patience and the mental uh -huh. uh, ability to to work on something till it's right and not let something slip by and say you'll fix it later or don't no one will hear that like just the fact of sitting there working on a part or a song or a take or a solo or a tone or every little aspect required doing it until everyone in the room thought it was right hmm. and that was kind of like mind-blowing to me i'm a little fidgety i like to do things kind of quick and in a flow and so for me to sit there and like, no, not that way. Oh, no, not that one. You know, they just have to re <laughs> yeah. really sit there and work hard like that. Mm -hmm. I think I never did it to that level on anything I ever did musically before. That's awesome. Well, it paid off, man. I mean, the record sounds great. I'll say, you know, as a person who's been in music my whole life and working with bands and being in bands, it was just the sheer sonic thing of hearing each of those songs being put together you know hearing them play new york city cops in my live room and with the microphones and hearing the way it came through the speakers like it was just mind-blowing it was not just like this is a cool song we're gonna make it really good it was like what the what the fuck is that yeah, cool. that is something completely unusual the way that those rhythms work the way the drums sound listen to the drums on New York City cops, they're really weird. Hmm. They are, don't sound like, they don't sound like normal drum. They sound like something else. Like this whole idea we were working with, with minimal miking and maximum power playing. Cool. Yeah. And this, the, it's, just, it was the, really the music of those songs I worked with them on that was the real blow away, mind expanding experience that I had.